Hello everybody, and welcome to the Creating Custom IP with Lattice IP Packager video training. In this training, we will be reviewing the basics of IP in the Lattice Toolflow, as well as how you can create your own IP using Lattice's IP Packager tool. Before we move on to the main portion of today's training, let's first quickly take a look at what's on today's agenda. First off, I'll go over some quick introductory level facts that you should know before working with IP in the Lattice Toolflow. After that, we'll continue on by reviewing an introduction to Lattice's IP Packager so we can learn more about what it can be used for and how we can use it to generate our own IP. For the last part of this training, I'll be walking us through a hands-on demonstration covering topics like RTL setup before IP packaging, how to create custom IP parameters, how to set up bus interfaces in an IP, as well as how to install and generate custom IP in Lattice FPGA projects. So with that said, Let's move on to the first portion of this training, where we'll discuss some quick facts about IP in the Lattice Toolflow. So the first quick fact that you should know has to do with the format of IP in Lattice Radiant and Propel, which is IP exact. Most people will not need to know this information to use IP in the Lattice Toolflow. However, to some this may be useful, as IP exact is a standard XML format that you would need to know if you wanted to create an IP package entirely from scratch. Continuing on, the next thing that you should know is that most IP packages consist of two file types. The first type of file are XML, which define the structure for the IP, defining things like its configurable parameters, IP settings, top-level ports, and bus interfaces. The next related fact to know is that there are two main methods for creating IP in the Lattice Toolflow. As was mentioned before, IP packages can be created entirely from scratch by creating our own XML files to define the IP package, or also by using Lattice IP Packager to easily generate the required XML files automatically. Another quick fact that you should know about Lattice IP is that there are two main types of IP. The first type of IP are called Foundation IP, which come with each Radiant and Propel tool installation and are tied to a specific version of each software. The other type of IP are soft IP, which are either downloaded from the IP server or installed using a custom .ipk IP package file. Whenever a custom IP is installed to either Radiant or Propel, it will be installed to the active IP installation directory, which is called Radiant IP Local for Radiant or Propel IP Local for Propel. These directories are automatically generated when each tool is installed or can be created later on by users. To check or modify your IP installation directory mapping, refer to the directory mapping tool setting for each respective software tool. Moving on, the last thing that you should know about IP in the Lattice Toolflow is that both Radiant and Propel come with IP Packager. There are no functional differences between the IP Packager that comes with each tool, as each release of Radiant and Propel should be synchronous in terms of features. However, one difference to keep in mind between the two versions of IP Packager are the supported devices that each tool can generate IP for. When using Radiant's IP Packager, all devices that are supported within Radiant are available for selection. However, for Propel's version of IP Packager, the device support will be a little different, instead supporting all the devices that can be generated within Propel Builder. With that said, let's continue on by reviewing some important information to know about Lattice IP Packager. So for those that are not familiar with IP Packager, your first question may be, what is IP Packager? Or what are some of the things that I can do with IP Packager? Well, to answer the first question, at a high level, IP Packager is a graphical tool that can be used to more easily create IP packages. As you may recall earlier on, there are two main ways to create IP packages, with the main difference being how the XML files are generated in each flow. In some cases, users may prefer to create their own IP packages entirely from scratch, creating the XML to define their IP package entirely by hand. However, the main selling point of IP Packager is that it is much more straightforward to use, only requiring you to know the basic settings that you want to use to customize your own IP. When using IP Packager, you do not need to know how to create an XML or what the correct format is, as IP Packager will handle all of this for you and automatically generate the correct files. Aside from that, another advantage of IP Packager is its Preview IP feature 
which can be used to check how your IP looks as you're developing it, to enable easier debugging during the development process. With that said, the main usages of IP Packager are to create custom IP packages from a minimal set of files, preview IP as you develop them, and also encrypt the RTL for an IP. Moving on, now that you have a better idea for what IP Packager is and what it can be used for, the next thing that you should know are the type of files that are associated with each IP package. At a high level, these file types can be broken down into three categories. XML files, which are generated automatically by IP Packager. Mandatory files, which need to be configured by the user before creating an IP package. And lastly, optional files, which are not required for every IP package and depend on the intents of the IP developers. With that said, there are three main types of XML files which are generated by IP Packager. The first is metadata.xml, which is the main XML that describes the IP package itself, detailing things like the IP supported devices, configurable parameters, top level ports, and much more. Every IP package in the Lattice Toolflow will have one of these files. Next up is bus underscore interface.xml, which describes the bus interface port mappings in an IP as well as memorymap.xml, which describes the register contents of an addressable memory mapped component. Both of these types of XMLs are specific to embedded IP in the Lattice Propel tool flow and are not required for Radiant IP. Moving on, the only mandatory and actually the most important file that must be created for every IP package is, as you can probably guess, the RTL for the IP package itself. Lastly are the optional IP package files, which, as previously mentioned, depend on the IP package and are not necessary for everyone. The first of these optional files is introduction.html, which is a useful HTML help information document which outlines high-level facts about the IP package, like its supported devices, revision history, as well as a brief description about the IP. You may have noticed this type of file before if you've ever seen some help information for an IP in Radiant or Propel. Next up are Python scripts, which are essentially a Python plugin which is used to implement custom Python functions to enhance the possibilities for what can be customized in an IP package. There are several settings in IP packages which are effectively a line of Python code, so oftentimes you can use these settings in conjunction with the plugin script to implement more complex logic to determine how to generate an IP based on user-selected inputs during IP configuration, or to implement some design rule checks depending on whatever settings are selected during IP configuration. Moving on, the next set of optional files are constraints, test bench files, and lastly, C slash C++ drivers, followed by a user license agreement file, which is an optional text file that contains a license agreement that must be agreed to whenever somebody installs your IP package. Moving on, the high level flow for creating your own IP can be broken into two simple halves. In the first half, you'll need to set up and create the source files for your IP, requiring you to begin by first developing your standalone RTL. Once your RTL is synthesizable and can pass through the tool flow on its own, the next step is to prepare it for IP packaging by adding parameters corresponding to whatever you want to configure in the final IP package. Aside from that, if you want to encrypt your RTL, you also need to add the encrypted pragmas at this point in time. Once your RTL is set up, the next step would be to create whatever additional files you want to package with your IP. This varies from IP package to IP package, and could be things such as C driver code, additional help documentation, a Python plugin script, or any of the other types of optional files that we mentioned in the previous slide. Once the first half of your IP development is done, it's time to move on to the second half, which has to do with actually creating the IP package in IP Packager. Within IP Packager, the first thing that you will need to do is define the basic IP settings, like the supported devices, IP name, RTL, top level ports, and all other mandatory settings. Once your basic IP settings are configured, the next step would be to add the additional associated IP files from the third step of the first half of the IP creation flow. Once your IP has all of its associated files, the next step of this flow is to begin customizing your IP by adding custom parameters and bus interfaces depending on how you want to use your IP. And finally, 
once the settings are all defined, the last part of the custom IP creation flow is to package the IP for use in Radiant or Propel. Now that we've finished reviewing some of the most important basic information to know about IP packaging in the Lattice Toolflow, let's transition over to my desktop view so we can go through a hands-on exercise to get a better idea for how IP packaging really works. So as you can see from my screen, I'm beginning with three Verilog source files, which I'll be using as the source RTL for my IP package. If we take a look at the top level file for my IP, you can see that I have the parameters that I want to be configurable defined at the top level of my top module. And if we scroll down, we can see that I'm using these parameters in conjunction with generate statements in order to generate my IP in various ways, depending on the parameters that are selected. Now, if we transition over to Propel Builder, IP Packager can be launched by selecting Tools, then the IP Packager from the toolbar. And once IP Packager loads, to get started, you first need to select the directory that you want to develop your IP in by selecting the Open Directory button from the top left. Each IP package that you develop with IP Packager is tied to a specific directory, so you will either need to select an existing one or create your own. It's worth noting that IP Packager will automatically generate most of the required files for your IP package, so in most cases it's better to start from a new empty directory to improve organization and prevent any existing files from being overridden if you're starting with a new IP package. For this demonstration, I'm going to be creating a new directory called LED underscore driver. And now that we've selected an IP directory, our view will change a bit. The main thing to keep in mind here is IP Packager's Project Navigator, which consists of a few tabs that are used to switch between IP Packager's main few pages. The first tab, called Metadata, is the page that we're currently on. In this tab, we will be defining the basic information for our IP, as well as other important information, like its top-level ports, bus interfaces, and configurable parameters. Aside from that, there are also the Design Files, Test Bench, and MIST tabs, each of which are used to add different types of files that are associated with an IP package. And lastly, there's Doc Assistant, which is a useful utility that can be used to quickly generate an introduction help document for your IP. With that said, the first thing that we need to do is define the basic settings for our IP, like its library name, which controls the name that our directory will be generated to when it's instantiated in actual design, the name of the IP, which is the functional name and should not contain any spaces or special characters, as well as the IP version, which I'm going to leave as 1.0.0. However, you can set this to any alphanumeric combination of numbers and letters. Next up are the supported devices. If you select any device, then your IP will be generatable for any device in either Radiant or Propel. However, you can narrow down the device support for your IP using the checkboxes next to each device family's name. For this IP, I'll be enabling the options for Avant, Certus Pro NX, Certus NX, Mach XL5 NX, and Crosslink NX. And if you want to be even more specific with the devices that can use your IP, you can use this device selector icon next to each family's name to further limit the devices that can generate your IP. For this example walkthrough, I'm not going to use any of these device specific settings, however, and will limit my IP to the device families that I selected before. Next, I'm going to set the category for my IP to be called Custom, which is the name that it will be sorted under in IP Catalog once it's installed in either Radiant or Propel, followed by the display name for my IP, which I'll call APB LED Driver. And lastly, I'm going to select both Radiant and Propel as the supported platforms for my IP, so it can be installed and generated in either tool. Now that I've finished defining the basic information for my IP package, the next step is for me to add the associated files. Since I only have three RTL files, I can add those by selecting Design Files from the Project Navigator on the left side of my screen, and then select the Add button. Something to keep in mind here is that there's also an Add Reference button, which can be used to reference some source files from a different directory without copying them over to this IP's directory. As a default behavior, 
for the add button is to copy any files added over here to the same directory. If any of the modules within your IP contain encrypted pragmas, you can automatically invoke the Lattice encryption engine before IP packaging by selecting the encryption checkbox next to each respective file's name. For more information on how to set up these encrypted pragmas in your RTL, refer to the HDL file encryption step section of the Lattice Radiant Web Help. Moving on, I don't have any other test bench or miscellaneous files that I want to add to my IP package, so I'm going to continue on to the last section here, which is called Doc Assistant. As mentioned before, one of the optional files that can be added with an IP package is an introduction HTML doc that contains basic information about an IP package. A useful feature of IP Packager is this Doc Assistant tab, which can be used to quickly generate the, one of these introduction HTML files without having any actual knowledge of HTML or how to create one yourself from scratch. All the settings in this section of IP Packager are optional and are not case sensitive, so I'm going to quickly input some basic information about my IP package before proceeding. And now that I've finished setting up this introduction to HTML how I like, I can generate and add it to my project by clicking the Save and Add to IP Package button at the bottom right of my screen here. And if we go back to the miscellaneous tab, you can see that the introduction HTML file was automatically generated and added to our IP project. Moving on, now that we've finished the first part of our IP packages setup and have added all of its associated files, the next step is for us to return back to the metadata tab and continue defining our IP package. Now that our RTL is added, the next logical step is for us to define the top level ports for our IP. There are two main ways for us to do this either by right-clicking in, out, or in, out, and then selecting add port, or by right-clicking and then selecting infer ports from HDL, which can be used to automatically infer the ports from your IP by parsing through the top-level design files that we added earlier on. And as we can see from this pop-up, all the top-level ports from the top module appear here, and we can choose which ports we want to infer by enabling or disabling the checkboxes next to each port's name. With that said, at this point, we can go a few different directions with our IP packages set up, either by creating and defining the parameters that we want to configure, or by adding the interfaces and memory map for our IP. For this demonstration, however, I'm going to continue by adding the interface and memory map for our IP. Each secondary type interface must have an associated memory map, so I'm going to create my own by right-clicking memory map, and then selecting add a memory map. At this point, I can modify the name of my memory map by double-clicking it and then clicking Enter. Moving on, we need to define an address block for our memory map. Which we can further break down by adding registers and then register fields to add definitions for individual bits of multi-bit registers. For this demonstration, I'm not going to spend too much time defining the memory map. However, this is primarily used for embedded designs, as this information is propagated to propel projects and can be used by embedded developers to better understand how to interface with your IP. With that said, now that I've created my basic memory map, I'm going to create the first interface for my IP, which will be an APB secondary type. Similar to memory maps, the display name for any interface can be modified by double-clicking and then inputting the name that you want to change the interface name to. Moving on, I need to select the actual type of interface using the interface type selection dropdown. And then I also need to select the actual type of interface using the role dropdown. Since I'm adding a secondary type bus interface, I also need to add a memory map which I can do by selecting the dropdown and then selecting the memory map that we just created. Moving on, the next step is for us to map the top level ports from our design to match the specific interface signals for the bus that we selected. It's worth noting that not all signals are required, which you can check by selecting the logical port name and then viewing whatever is output on the right side of IP Packager.
And before we finish defining the last port for our APB interface, I want to quickly preview the IP so we can get an idea for what we're doing right now and how it looks in the resultant IP package. And as you can see from the component preview, all the top level ports from our design are visible with the exception of the APB ports, which have been combined into a single bus called APB underscore S. With the exception here being the APB underscore P write signal, which is the only top level signal that I haven't added to our bus interface yet. When working with Propel projects, all the signals within a bus interface are automatically connected when connecting two components. So it's important to define interface buses this way beforehand in IP Packager for any embedded IP so that they can be connected correctly. Moving on, the last interface that I need to add is a single bit interrupt signal, which is used to interface with the Propel RIS-5 processors, which I'll call IRQ0. And if we once again preview our IP, we can see that the interrupt port was correctly added as we defined just now. Now that we've finished setting up the ports and interfaces, the next part that's left for us is to add the parameters to our IP that we want to be configurable. Before we do that, however, we need to first add parameter tabs and groups to better sort our IP in the IP configuration window. Parameter tabs are essentially pages of IP settings, and parameter groups are subsections of these pages, which divide IP parameters into various groups. For this simple example, we'll only be creating a single tab and group to get started. And now that we've added both of those, we can begin adding parameters by right-clicking and then selecting Add Parameter. The name of a parameter is extremely important and must exactly match the name of the parameter that is at the top level of your IP's top module. For this demonstration, the first parameter I'm going to be configuring is the family parameter. One of the most important settings in the parameter configuration window is the type, as this controls how the user input is processed during IP generation. Param are the same as parameters and are directly written to the RTL of an IP package after it is generated, while inputs are not written to the IP's generated RTL and are often used in conjunction with other parameters to calculate some value based on user inputs. Before we move on, I want to quickly point out that if you ever need a reminder of what a setting is or how its various options work, you can quickly get an idea by clicking the setting in IP packager and then checking the setting description that pops up on the right side of the screen. With that said, since this parameter is in fact a string, I'm going to leave the value type as its default value, since it's already correct. Next, I need to set a default value for this parameter, which I'll call Nexus in this case. Moving on, I'm going to use the option setting to create a Python list of options that users can select from when configuring the IP. The only requirement to keep in mind here is that the contents of this list must match the value type that you selected and also that whatever setting you picked as the default must also be included in this list. And before we preview the parameter that we just created, I'm going to quickly rename the group that the parameter is sorted to from the default name into parameters. Moving on, I'm going to continue on creating my IP package by adding the remaining few parameters that defined at the top level of my IP's top module populating each parameter settings similar to how I configured the first parameter.
And if we want to again preview the IP, we can see that the parameters that we just added are working as expected. As you may have remembered me mentioning earlier, many of the settings in IP Packager are essentially one line of Python code. What this means is that if we can fit a valid Python expression on a single line, it's possible to configure it as part of our IP package. For this example, instead of individually typing each individual integer to a list that I want users to select from, I could instead use a for loop to automatically populate the list contents. And if we preview the IP again, we can see that the drop-down list of selectable options was populated with even more values than before in accordance with the for loop that we just used to populate the list. Moving on, I'm going to continue by defining the last two parameters that I want to be configurable as part of my IP package. And before pretty seeing on to the last part of the setup process for IP package, I'm going to add another parameter group to separate the int underscore enable setting that we just added, so we can easily differentiate which parts of our IP are actual Verilog parameters in our top level module, and which are just GUI level settings. So now that we've finished setting up parameters for our IP package, the last part of the IP creation flow is to use these parameters to interface with our IP to control how it's generated. For example, if we take a look at the ports that were populated earlier on, the range for our LED output is static and will always be 32 down to 0, regardless of the parameters that we select. To make the width of this port dynamic, we can use the name of the IOCOMP parameter to dynamically update the width of this port, depending on whatever users select during IP configuration. And if we once again preview the IP, you can see that the width of LED underscore O is updating depending on the I.O. count value that we select in parameter configuration. Moving on, you may also remember the enable interrupt setting. To use this setting to determine whether or not to include the interrupt port for our IP, we're going to select the int underscore O port and use its stick low setting. The stick low setting is essentially a single line of Python code that should return either true or false. If the statement is evaluated to be false, then the port is tied to low with all zeros during IP generation. For this specific port, I'll be using the interrupt enable parameter as a logical check to determine whether or not to disable the interrupt port of this IP. And if we preview the IP, we can see that disabling the setting will disable the interrupt port at the top level of the component, and that it is enabled whenever the setting is left checked. Using the same stick low setting, we can reference the user interface parameter for all of our LMI ports to tie them to low whenever an APB is selected as interface type. And using a similar concept, we can apply the same logic to tie the APB interface low whenever LMMI is selected as the interface type for our IP.
And that concludes the second to last step of the IP creation process. Now that we've finished setting up our IP package, the final steps are for us to preview our IP once again to ensure that everything is as expected. And then click the package IP button to generate an IPK, which can be used to install the IP in either Radiant or Propel. If you enabled encryption for any of the RTL on your IP, this is the point at which the IP would be encrypted as well. With that said, to install the IP that we just created, let's move over to Propel Builder, where we'll need to click the Install IP button at the top of its IP catalog in order to install the IP that we just created. By default, the IPK will always be generated to the IPs directory, so we'll set over there to select the correct file, and then click Open to select it. Before we finish installing the IP, a user license agreement will pop up with the standard IP license agreement for us to agree to. If you specified your own user license agreement during IP configuration, then that's what would appear here instead of this default license agreement. With that said, we're going to click Accept to finish installing our IP. And as we can see from my IP catalog, our version 1.0.0 of our IPB LED driver IP was successfully installed and is currently sorted under a folder category called Custom, like we defined during the first part of our IP setup. Moving on, to generate the IP and use it in the Propel design, you first need to generate and instantiate it by double-clicking the IP's name from IP Catalog. Once you've done that, a pop-up will appear, prompting you to define a name and parameters for your IP package. Lastly, once you've finished setting up the IP, you can generate it by clicking Generate, and then Finish, and then instantiate it to the Active Design by clicking OK. At this point, the IP can be interfaced with the Propel Design like any other Propel IP, allowing us to easily connect bus interfaces by clicking and dragging the ports between two components. With that said, before we conclude this training, let's take a quick look at the files that were generated as part of our IP once it was instantiated to our design. As can be seen from my screen, the IP was generated under a folder called custom underscore IP in our project, like we defined during the initial part of the IP setup process when we selected our IP's library. Since we did not package any documentation or drivers with our IP, the only thing of interest here is to generate an RTL for the IP, which, as you can see, is actually just two files at this point. This first file, LED underscore inst, is actually the combined version of the original three source files that we specified, and contains all three modules, as well as a new top-level instance, which is generated in accordance to the parameters that we selected during IP configuration. And if we open this file and take a look, we can see that this is an automatically generated file, and that the top module name matches what we defined during component generation. And if we scroll down a little further, you can see that the first module is very simple and only instantiates the original IP top module, passing down the parameters that were specified during IP configuration and also tiling the disabled LMI ports to zero while connecting the enabled APB ports. That concludes this training. Thank you all for your time and attention.